Thank you for joining our October Produce Safety Educators Call. Um, I am very excited to have three fantastic speakers with us. Uh, this month, we are going to be talking about building interactive elements into your produce safety training. And for today's webinar, um, I have Dr. Kristen Woods, Mr. Billy Mitchell, and Ms. Gretchen Wall with us. And over the next hour, we are going to talk about a couple of different things, but all to really um, encourage trainers to include hands-on activities and other sources of interaction. Um, Kristen and Billy are going to be talking a little bit about why uh, interactive elements are important. And um, they're also going to be sharing with us some resources that are relatively new resources with suge suggestions on how to actually build those elements into produce safety trainings. And then Gretchen is going to be um, talking a little bit about time management. And I know when I train, one of the common questions I get is, you know, these are really nice, but how do we actually make this happen? How do we build it into the agenda? So Gretchen is going to be sharing us with us some tips in that regard. And a couple of quick instructions as we get started. Um, all participants are muted. There will be time for questions and discussion at the end of the meeting. And I will leave it up to the uh, our speakers for today to see if they want to incorporate discussion throughout the talk. Um, I will say feel free to use the chat box to ask questions as well. I know we will be monitoring the chat box. We'll be monitoring if people raise their hands or ask any other questions. Um, and just a couple of reminders, this session will be recorded and the presentation will be shared via the listserv and on our website after the call. And uh, another reminder here, the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect legal advice, views, or positions of the PSA. So just to get started, um, I want to give a very quick introduction to our three speakers and I expect for most of you, if you have participated in past Produce Safety Educators calls, you're probably familiar with all three of our speakers. So we have Dr. Kristen Woods. Uh, she used to work for the Produce Safety Alliance, and she is a regional extension associate or regional extension agent with Auburn University. We have Mr. Billy Mitchell. Uh, he is a produce safety enthusiast and a current master's student at the University of Georgia. Many of you have probably worked with him in a previous capacity with the local food safety collaborative. And we also have Ms. Gretchen Wall, also formerly with the Produce Safety Alliance. Uh, she is now the Director of Food Safety and Quality at the International Fresh Produce Association, or IFPA. And with that, I am going to stop and turn it over to Kristen. All right, thank you, Donna. Give me just a second to get my slides up. And they should be up, so somebody should tell me if they're not. Uh, but thank you very much, Donna, for that introduction. And I also wanna thank the Produce Safety Alliance for putting this uh, webinar together. Uh, today, I am really excited to get to talk about some of the work that we're doing in the Southern region to facilitate and support uh, produce safety trainers and in including hands-on activities into produce safety training. I'm going to start us off by sharing some resources and uh, some of the activities we've developed, and then Billy's actually going to demonstrate one of the activities that uh, he uh, led the development of. So how hard is it to, um, well, well, first of all, why do participants need to be engaged uh, during a pretty safety uh, course? Um, participant engagement leads to improved learning outcomes. We know this by just the feeling in our gut, um, but there's some uh, evidence that, that leads us to believe that as well. So when we have increased engagement, we see more than just knowledge gain. We actually see people building skills, taking action. And at the highest levels, we see capacity building with the grower communities where they're able to take the training we've provided and apply it to new and complex situations. And even better, those growers are able to help other growers do the same. So Andrew Grody is based on Malcolm Knowles' assertion that the characteristic, characteristics of adult learners are distinct from the needs of children. So Knowles suggested that adults need to be involved in the learning process and that unlike children who are little sponges absorbing everything in the environment around them, 
uh, experience provides a foundation for learning with adults. It becomes really important to bring adults past experiences and knowledge into play in order to help them build upon that knowledge. Uh, immediate relevance is key and adult learning is typically problem centered. Uh, the growers may not remember that a cleaning and sanitation record is required for equipment, food contact surfaces, but if we have them complete a sanitation record during a training, they will remember that part of it. So how hard is it to learn? Uh, they say that the brain actually consumes more calories than any other organ in our body. Um, that's why it can be, we can get so tired after a day of training or after a day of work or school where we're having to think a lot. Um, and, and that's because of those neuronal pathways uh, take a lot of energy, a lot of ATP to disrupt them and to rebuild them. So if you look at an example of um, just a personal example of mine, when I'm typing my name, I spell it K-R-I-S-T-I-N. And I have a colleague in Arkansas, Kristen Gibson, who spells her name incorrectly. She spells it with an E-N. And every time I have an opportunity to work with her and I find myself sending her some emails, I have to type, um, I, I type K-R-I-S-T-I-N and then delete, delete, and I have to put the E-N on there. And that's just simply because in 40 years of writing my name, um, those neuronal pathways are so set then my brain just won't tell my hands to type the, her name the way that she wants to spell it. Um, but, you know, the same thing happens when we're trying to, to remember to take a new medication, trying to change your routine in the morning, right? Or um, if you're cohabitating with um, someone that leaves the toilet seat up or down, trying to remember to do those things can be incredibly difficult because you're actually talking about tearing down neuronal pathways and then building new ones. Um, learning new skills also takes energy, uh, which requires a lot of motivation. Uh, so if we think about like cleaning a harvest bin, mixing sanitizer, or identifying contaminated produce while harvesting. So someone might um, have spent decades harvesting, but if we ask them to add the activity of looking for contamination as they're harvesting, this is, is um, they have to destroy some neuronal pathways to do that and then build new ones to make that a routine. Um, so they have to be properly motivated and energized to be able to do that. All right, so I wanted to uh, get a little bit of feedback from you guys and find out what um, engages you when you are training and I want, or when you are attending a training. So think about a recent training and think about when you were most engaged during that training and when you were least engaged. And if you would take a minute and type into chat uh, what you were doing during those times and what the instructor was doing during those times. I'm gonna see if I can manage to pull up chat on my screen. Yeah, all right. So I'm going to give it a couple seconds and hopefully some folks are typing and then we can uh, discuss what we see there. So Ellen says telling a story, not reading a PowerPoint, right? Good. Oh, now it's moving too fast for me to catch them all. Thank you guys for all the responses. Um, Engaged when being asked to participate. Most engaged when it's conversational with the instructor and the audience. I like that, Billy, thank you. Um, Mary says, engaged when I was actually taking a water sample. So you were actually moving around. Hands on activities, stories. Good, thank you. Uh, least engaged with long slide sets. Yeah, especially if there's no um, input from the audience during those long slide sets. Engaged when sharing experience. Yeah, oh, this is going, uh, Laura, it's, it's been a minute, but when participants were given time aside to work out a problem or try a new task. So you are actually like uh, taking a problem-centered approach. Yeah. All right. So obviously there are too many for me to read all the way through them, but I think you guys have made a, a really um, a good point. Um, 
Jacob says, least engaged when sitting and listening to the instructor going over PowerPoint. Yep. Okay. So um, we see a very, um, very thoroughly the common theme there is when participants are actually doing something, when they're engaged in conversation, um, when they're physically up and taking a water sample, um, then their brains are working and, and they're engaged. Um, passive learning doesn't occur very well with adults. Right? Um, yeah. Okay, so thank you guys. I appreciate that um, backup and all of those comments. We got a lot of good comments there. Um, so with all of that said, I want to um, point you guys to an additional resource. Um, if you would like to learn more about ways, um, about the ways and how to incorporate hands-on activities into produce safety training, um, I want to point you to the uh, Local Food Safety Collaborative Guide to Hosting an Interactive Hands-On Produce Safety Training. Um, and this was developed by my colleague Bridget Brannon and I in 2020. I think it was published in 2021 as part of some of the FDA funded local food safety collaborative work and was a collaboration among quite a few folks, including Produce Safety Alliance and Billy. And this guide is available on the Produce Safety Clearinghouse. And in it, you will find um, more information about um, about adult education and why these methods tend to work, some examples of produce safety related activities, and um, they're complete with an engagement score. So you can try to, to uh, pick activities that are going to result in the most engagement for um, the community members you're serving. Um, there are also some ideas around how to encourage engagement in virtual training and information about microphones and other equipment that might be useful for on-farm demonstrations and workshops. Um, and finally, places to find funding for produce safety training um, because hands-on training tends to be more expensive. Uh, you need supplies sometimes to do that and additional people to, to pull that off as well. All right, so um, I get the question a lot, does, does the hands-on components, well, people like them a lot, but they really make any difference. Do we have any data? Um, and you know, we think they make a difference and data from other industries, especially the healthcare industry um, says this is so, but we really lack the data to empirically support that claim when it comes to produce safety. Um, what you're looking at here is a data analysis from the first two years of Produce Safety Alliance training. The first column are, is uh, trainings that included hands-on components, and the second column there is the, the national average from the Produce Safety Alliance evaluations. And so those are means of Likert scale scores um, for each of the uh, Produce Safety Alliance training modules. Um, so we, on that evaluation, we asked uh, self-perceived knowledge gain and then confidence in implementing practices for each of the modules. Um, what we see when we look at this is no statistically significant significance due to the small sample size and the hands-on trainings that we have. Um, but courses that incorporated the hands-on learning tended to have higher self-perceived knowledge gain and higher confidence in implementing practices. Um, I will point out that I was the lead at all of those. So that's why I had the data to pull out. And we really need a larger data set um, and additional instructors to conduct a proper data analysis. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears with uh, the rest of my time here. And I wanted to share some of the activities we've developed through a 2019 uh, NEFA Food Safety Outreach Program funded project. We call this the Farm Innovation Project. And for this project, we have constructed five uh, trailers um, that are deployed in Alabama, Mississippi, and Georgia. And those trailers uh, carry, uh, they're filled with hands-on activities that can be used for standalone produce safety workshops or to enhance um, PSA trainings as well. All of the activities focus on conservation and food safety. Our aim was to develop, um, to help growers take a holistic approach to integrating produce safety that aligns with their conservation goals. 
And we had an advisory board of farmers in, in those three states that guided the needs assessment, the program development, the evaluation methods, and the outreach plan. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, quite a number of fabulous partners involved in the project, and we're heavily into the outreach stage now, and we started to look at some of the, the data that we've gotten back from that. Uh, so today I wanted to highlight a small piece of this project. We've developed 15 fact sheets and activity facilitator guides that um, will make project replication easier. Um, and the facilitator guides include step-by-step -step instructions for educators, uh, complete with learning objectives, important talking points for each activity, and a supply list to put the activity together. And then the fact sheets are to be given to participants to reinforce those learning objectives. All of these resources are published on the Food Safety Clearinghouse, and there are uh, a ton more resources available there that are, has have originated by educators from around the country. And I think Donna is gonna put a link in the chat that can help you find those other resources as well. I'd encourage you to check out that site. I use it quite frequently when I'm looking for resources. Uh, so I'm gonna go through these first seven activities on the screen, and then Billy's going to demo the one on making a farm map. All right, so this first activity is on building a hand washing station. And the photos depict the hand washing station building activity. And so I want to, um, to bring your attention to the small group size and the hands-on nature of the activity. Um, the literature supports the use of small groups and skill building training so that we can give everyone a chance to, uh, to be hands-on with uh, whatever skill we're building. Um, and our participant comments really reflect that. They liked having a chance to actually do this. Um, the talking points for the facilitator guide include why, when, and how to wash hands, of course. And then you can, as you can see, we're actually building this during the training. Uh, we suggest cutting the lumber ahead of time so that you don't have a power saw going on. Um, for me, that would just be terrifying to try to do during a training and um, make sure everyone's safe. Um, but we do give participants the electric drill and other tools that they need to actually put together the pieces. Um, and uh, we provide some safety glasses there too. Uh, so the hand washing station design is not unique to this project. Um, the touch-free handle on the water vessel was designed by Daniel Smith and Dr. Sana at Tuskegee University. And the stand was designed by Ann Sawyer and Annalisa Holberg at the University of Minnesota. All right, so this next one is on uh, building on-farm cold storage using a coal bot. And for this one, the facilitator guide includes reminders to talk about increasing shelf life, the economic benefits of increasing shelf life, and the risks from condensation in cold storage. Um, the folks get intimidated by the wiring, and it's, it's nice to see everyone realize how very easy it is to hook up a coal bot to an air conditioning unit. And we've invested in several cool bot units so that everyone at the training can be hands-on with the wires. Uh, there are two fact sheets for this activity. One is more on the benefits of cold storage in general, and then the other one is on uh, is more cool bot focused. This next activity, uh, here we see uh, Dr. Elizabeth Miles from Alcorn State University helping facilitate a cleaning and sanitizing activity. She's sharing some information about the need to clean before sanitizing and looking at the sanitary design of cleaning brushes and sponges. On the right, you see how the supplies for this activity pack in a five gallon bucket, easy for storage in the trailer. Uh, all of the activities have a storage place on the trailer for easy access and easy transport. Uh, so we've actually been able to purchase cleaning kits for participants. So when after they go through this activity, um, they get to go home with a kit that has some of those nice Vicam uh, brushes that are made with sanitary design, uh, some detergents and food grade bleach and test strips, gloves, a spray bottle and a measuring cup too. Hey, Kristen. Yeah. It's me, Billy. Uh, you had a, a comment in the chat box. I know that you might not be able to see the chat. <clears throat> it's a it's kind of a two-parter. The okay. first was just 
as you go through these activities, would you kindly provide a recommended time limit for each activity? That's okay. the first. And the second one is they're just hard pressed to see how these could fit into the standard eight hour training. Okay. Um, I'm going to, I'll answer the first question. Uh, we, uh, we allot 20 or 30 minutes for each activity, depending on how much time we have in the day. Um, it just depends on how it's set up and what we're trying to fit within. So sometimes when we're trying to fit it within a produce safety alliance training, we're probably more on the 20 minute side. But if it's uh, a workshop where we have all day to go through lots of these activities, we'll take a little bit longer. Um, and we generally do it as part of a rotating schedule. So we would have, say, five of these stations set up around a, a room, five or six, and then folks rotate every 30 minutes to, and then go through the, each activity. Um, so you can, you can flex the time a little bit depending on what you need to do it, it within. Um, I am going to uh, hand the second question off to Gretchen. She's going to go over time management in a few minutes, and I, I know that she'll she'll be able to address how to fit hands-on activities into trainings. Um, but for me personally, it's just a matter of knowing the audience and knowing what can be shortened a little bit in order to fit this these hands-on activities in and knowing what's most valuable for those growers too. Um, we also tend to extend our trainings to a day and a half in two days. Um, and when the growers, um, I've never had a complaint from a grower that attended a two-day training and um, knew that a one-day was an option, right? Um, they always find the two-day trainings to be really valuable um, and they're happy to be there for that long, so. Um, all right. Did that answer the question or enough to put the rest of it off to Gretchen? Yeah. All right. Um, so this next activity is on using the pesticide product labeling system and mixing and monitoring sanitizers. Uh, so for this one, participants actually find the EPA registration number on a jug of bleach. They look it up on their phones everybody doing this on their own phone. So it's hands-on for everybody. Um, they determine what it can be used for and then they guide each other in mixing it and using the test strips to see if they've mixed it properly. Uh, we provide a PPE and a couple of example labels of different sanitizers, including one that's not labeled for food use uh, to generate some discussion about the differences. Um, and then we also provide some wrong test strips so that they can learn what to look for and make sure they have the right test strips. Um, we originally had the cleaning and sanitizing activities as one activity, uh, but then we separated them out because there's just so much to talk about in both areas. Uh, we couldn't do both justice in that 20 or 30 minute time slot. Uh, so we do them one after another usually now. All right, so this next one, um, here we see a small group of, um, of growers developing the skills to collect an aseptic water sample. Uh, so the facilitator guide will cover the differences in safety among municipal well and surface water sources, and also irrigation methods, uh, keeping animals out of water sources. And the, the fact sheets stress the importance of testing, but don't go into the produce safety rule criteria as that is in flux. Uh, when we do this activity, we provide state-specific instruction on where they can take their water sample. And we also provide a small cooler with ice packs, a Sharpie, disposable gloves, and alcohol prep pads to get them started in collecting their first water samples. So this next activity, I have it labeled fencing, but it's actually on how to install an electric fence for wildlife exclusion or to exclude grazing animals from a growing area. Uh, we're using net wire because many of our producers have goats. Um, so like the pool bot activity, the wires can be really intimidating for people. And it's really nice to see folks realize how easy it is to set up an electric fence. Um, and Properly rotational grazing is not just about food safety. There's also the potential to improve soil health and farm profitability by reducing overgrazing. So it becomes a, a great like whole farm discussion in that session. All right, so this is the last one that I'm going to go over, um, and it's probably my favorite activity. We have participants help us demonstrate what happens when the water runs over bare ground. 
versus ground covered with a cover crop or a vegetative buffer. Then we have some heavy discussion around saving topsoil for farming, protecting water sources from a rat runoff that can contain bacterial or chemical contamination. Uh, we talk about the, about the potential to use woody buffers to enhance wildlife habitat or pollinator habitat. And then we talk about woody buffers that can be a habitat for raptors that can aid in rodent and reptile control in the growing area. Um, it's a change in mindset for many producers who want their fence lines and their areas around the growing area to look clean or uh, devoid of life. Um, so, but we, we think this is the way that we are going to be headed um, was we have some retailers that are now requiring 3% of land planted in pollinators. So um, there are a lot of different benefits to using vegetative buffers. So for food safety and, and for environmental um, enhancement. All right, so shifting gears a little bit, I wanted to share a little bit of our preliminary results. So I'm going to stress that this is preliminary and it will change as we add data to this data set. Um, but the graph shows uh, participant agreement with the statements related to vegetative buffers. The first two bars show the difference in whether or not participants think vegetative buffers can protect water quality pre and post activity. And then the second two bars ask them about their intent to use vegetative buffers on their farm. And we used a Wilcoxon signed ranks test to identify statistically significant differences. Uh, if you'll focus on the dark blue section on the right, that indicates strong agreement with the statements. And so it's easy to see that participants are more likely to agree that buffers can protect water quality and more likely to intend to use them on the farm after going through the activity. So we're actually seeing this trend for several of the activities, but not all of them. So there'll be more to come on uh, what we're seeing in the data. All right, so finally in this photo, you can see the technology station. We have a TV mounted on the outside of those mobile, tra mobile trailers for technology-based activities. Um, we have a quiet generator available on the inside for when we're in locations that lack electricity. And we added this technology station because we know we're dealing with a population of farmers that have highly varied uh, technology literacy. And so I can foresee an, an expansion of the area of computer literacy in the future. Um, this activity is a great one for producers who are considering food safety certification. And I am going to hand things off to Billy um, so that he can demo the activity. Great, thank you, Kristen. Yeah, I'm, I am just really excited to have the opportunity to share with y'all and run through this. The first thing I'm gonna do is ask Kristen if she can see, if you can see my screen. Very cool. So as an educator, we all want to do our best to prepare before we do our activities. So you'll wanna find, well, just where do these live? So the first thing you do is you would go to the clearinghouse, the resource that Kristen mentioned earlier, it's a resource that we love and you would search in here. What's amazing is it pulls up a bunch of things you've already searched. Apparently Kristen, I've searched you on the year before. I looked up phosphorus at one time. I even got the name of the project wrong and put in mobile innovation. But you wanna put in farm innovation, search, and you will find the resources. And within these resources, scrolling down, the one that we're gonna to do today is the field mapping fact sheet. And so for all these activities, it's laid out step-by-step step in a really visual way. Thanks to some great graphic design by Trisha. If you're on the call today, thank you for your hard work. But it lets you see it step-by-step step, and it gives you a chance to practice because saying going online and creating a Google map sounds so easy, but you'll start to see on every computer, it's a little different on every tablet, on every phone. And so there's an opportunity for you to practice before the activity starts. And then once you are ready to do it live, you'll go to Google and you'll put in Google Maps or any other map application that you use. I use Google. And working with the farmer, you'll find out what their farm name is or their farm address is. 
We saw in the chat box that people like it when they're engaged. So this is an opportunity. Unfortunately, this is a little luxury. But for you to not lecture with the farmer, but find out where their farm is, I'm going to think of one of my favorite farms. I know you're not supposed to have favorites. Rogers Greens and Roots. It's a great farm in Georgia. And I will click on the satellite so we can see a satellite view. And I'll collapse the side panel. And immediately you can start talking with the grower about what you see. What is it about their farm? What's the area of their farm like? Does this little traffic circle bring them benefits or does it bring them risks? Oh, it's really great. People stop by our farm all the time. It's really bad. People stop by our farm all the time. But using this map, you can start to have these conversations. And even if this isn't part of a PSA grower training, you can start to tie it back to different parts of the PSA grower training. You can look at the different fields and talk about traceability. You can scroll into different areas and really ask and try and figure out, well, what's going on here? Like this little building right here, you can ask them about that. I know that on this farm, it's a well house. You can ask them if that's their source for irrigation. Does that go to their wash pack area? It just gives you an opportunity to go through each module that you trained and tie it back. So no longer is produce safety silo, but they can start to see how all these things tie in together. This map might be a good thing for when a soil amendment company comes through and they can see it. It can be a really good thing for employee training. And it also gives you a chance to kind of scroll out and get that bird's eye view. And you might see at the very bottom, the Chattahoochee River is right below this farm. And you can have questions about that. Does that river ever flood? What happens with this river? But making this map is just a chance for you to engage in a bunch of different produce safety concepts. Then there's a few things you can do either live or with the farmer. If it's just on their phone, you can screenshot it, send it to yourself and put it in an email. And then there are also multiple ways using Google to go to file and you can print it and you have the opportunity to either save it as a PDF or print it off right away. And once you've gone through that activity and you've walked through the technology with the growers, the different options, because some people will be really comfortable with this and some people won't, then you'll also have this tangible thing. Somebody put in the chat box, it's nice when people go home with something. It's nice to have a tangible map. And this is something that they can take back and they can explore those concepts more. So we'll share something else just to kind of review different ways to share those concepts a little bit more. And Kristen, will you do me the eternal favor. I can no longer see your screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Way cool. So I've worked with Rogers Greens and Roots, and we've just started to talk about some different things. So we know that there was one well house. That's where this blue heart is. And so you can work that farm and start to identify, well, where are all the other wells on the farm? And maybe that's just your first map. You're doing a risk assessment around irrigation. And so you just make a map of all the wells are. This is really helpful to remember. This is really helpful for employee training. So maybe the employees know that there are three wells that need to happen. Or if you bring a company out, you can give them this map. It's also then an opportunity to build it out even more. You can start to draw irrigation lines. You can start to draw where little manifolds are. That's where those red crosses are. If you've ever worked on a farm where it got a little weedy or you've had a new employee and you've had that tractor go over some irrigation supplies, this map is a way to help fix some of those problems. So you're talking about produce safety, but as Phil Toko, produce safety specialist says, you can also have those doubly smiley faces. You can have these added benefits coming from your produce safety conversation. And the one part that I find the most benefit in that we see with the farms is you can start to just make a field map. Again, this is so beneficial for employee training but it's also a way to introduce to farms that idea of traceability. So we go to module seven, we've gone through all those slides, you've introduced lock codes. This is a way to talk about, well, how could this just improve things on your farm, knowing the different names of the fields? And since most farmers are a little more imaginative than we might be sometimes, it might be just ABC, the fields might be named after their dogs, but it's a chance to work with them and just think about how can this map lower your produce safety risk, but also improve the benefits on your farm. And making this map with them is a tool for that. 
engagement. It's just not a lecture about how maps can be beneficial, beneficial, but it's an opportunity to create a map together to show how the maps are beneficial. And with that, Kristen, I'll pass the mic back over to you. Thank you, Billy. That was great. Um, I, um, you know, we've done this a few times at events, and I like to see the growers engaged in actually doing something on their devices and their phones. And we actually bought printers also, um, so that we could actually print the farm maps that they make in training. And we haven't gotten to do that yet, but hopefully that will be an additional enhancement to this session. So I think it's time to hand it off to Gretchen. All right. Thanks, y'all. Um, it's nice to be back with the Produce Safety Educators Group. Thanks for having me here today. What I'm going to talk about, let me get my screen up here, is how do we incorporate some of these activities into our produce safety trainings, recognizing that it's already a very packed training, um, especially because we have developed it as a one-day course. As Kristen mentioned, there's a lot of ways that we can structure trainings to go to a multi-day setup, or even just think about what are these activities that we can spend five or 10 minutes just quickly to engage participants throughout the training that doesn't necessarily extend it into a multi-day training, but could really reinforce some of those teaching concepts that we're trying to get across. And, and what I'm going to go over here is I think broadly applicable to any type of training that you're doing, but I'll try to sprinkle in some examples of things that I've seen done well with incorporating activities and maybe sometimes um, with activities that maybe didn't go well that people um, had planned out that took a lot longer than they anticipated. So let me get into the slide deck. First and foremost is knowing your audience. I, I know Kristen also said this at the very start, um, you have to know who you're teaching to and what their background information is. And one of the best things that I think you can do even in advance of a training is to just send out a pre-survey. If you have some type of online registration or some way to contact the participants who are signed up in the course, just asking a few simple questions in advance will help you be able to know what's their education coming in the door? Are there any particular areas? that they do have interest in. Let's say you know a, a handful of them really express interest in doing some hands-on activities related to post-harvest water, then maybe that's where you spend your time in that training rather than trying to incorporate an activity in every module. Maybe then you just spend your time in module six doing a hands-on activity related to um, post-harvest water with sanitizers. But that is one way that you can really target who your or and know who your audience is to target those exercises. You also have to know just some general characteristics of your audiences as well. Are they typically on time? Um, there are groups where you know maybe you know that they're very casual and they're going to roll in the door right when the training is supposed to start or a few minutes late. So you need to plan um, in advance for those sorts of things, as well as if they're real socialites. I know that we've had trainings where it's almost the most difficult part of the training is getting them to sit back in their seats after a break because they all want to be talking to one another, which is a great knowledge exchange. And I think that's one of the biggest values of in-person trainings. But, you know, knowing that in advance will help you make plans to get people in their seats, to usher people back in the room, to really be a little bit more regimented in your time management so that you know, if you say the break is going to end at 3 p.m., the break's got to end at 3 p.m., which means someone needs to be out in the hallway being slightly annoying and ringing a cowbell or whatever they're going to do to get people back in the room. You also need to anticipate what some other questions might be. And again, that could be um, gleaned from a survey that you do in advance of time. But just generally knowing your audience is going to go a long way in how you manage your training. This also seems like a no-brainer, but it's actually one of the most common issues I've seen in time management with trainings is that, you know, there might be one key person or, or two people that show up really early to get everything going, get the coffee set up, get the beverages, get the PSA manuals out on the tables, um, but maybe the whole teaching team wasn't there to support and the major heavy lift rested on one or two individuals and, and things just could have been a lot smoother from the get-go. If you have a rocky start, that's going to continue throughout the rest of the day. So make sure the entire team is there to support the training from the start. 
you know, is the technology working? If you're doing an online training, is everyone comfortable with Zoom? Log on early, make sure their audio and video is functioning well in advance. These meetings happen even weeks, months in advance of online trainings, just as a best practice to make sure everyone's on the same page. Are the resources available? Are they set up, especially with hands-on activities? They take time sometimes to get all the materials out, to have things labeled, to make sure there's the right amount for the participants that you're having in the course. So making sure that's set up in advance, that might mean you coming in a day early for an in-person training, just to make sure everything's set and ready to go before the training starts. The third tip that I have, um, I can't stress enough, is to know your team and know the game plan really well. If you've been working with a team for a long time, you can probably anticipate who is gonna to wanna to talk about what and what topics they're really passionate about because maybe sometimes they do run over time on certain um, of the modules. So knowing who's really passionate and who really needs to focus on keeping that time to a minimum and ha having those expectations up front. So having those pre-meeting, pre-training calls with the teaching team to really be clear about time management and being realistic about how much time you put on the agenda versus how much time in reality the presenter is actually going to take. There are certain people that I've worked with that may deliver specific modules a little bit longer than what we had proposed as um, established times for the PSA grower training curriculum. You know, I, I think module five is one of those that we tend to spend a lot of time in just because it's it's challenging. The regulation is a bit of a moving target. And then there's a lot of technical aspects that go along with that. So if you know that that's something that your audience really needs that information, you know you have a speaker who's gonna need a little extra time to cover that material, then you shift your times around to make sure that um, those modules are covered appropriately by the speakers. You also have to know what everybody's expertise is because it can help you and it can hurt you at the same time. If you're giving a presentation and someone asks you a question that you're a little uncertain of, maybe you don't have um, all of the facts that you want to share, but you know somebody on your team has that information and can share that quickly, you should be leaning on those individuals that have that knowledge so that you can keep things moving rather than going down some rabbit hole and spending a lot of time someplace where you don't need to be. And again, I, I can't stress enough, clear expectations and roles, and this goes back to pre-planning your trainings well in advance. Knowing the content also is very important. And I think this, um, this quote from Einstein really explains it perfectly. If you can't explain it simply, then you don't understand it well enough. And I think when you start getting into some of the curriculum modules, there may be topic areas that you're not as familiar with and you need to spend some time in advance of the training to brush up on a topic, read the references, especially reference those teaching notes that are provided in the PSA Train the Trainer bank, uh, Manual, because that will alleviate some of those hangups um, that if you get to a particular slide and it's just kind of on your threshold of technical knowledge, spend some time there. Really spend time polishing what key messages that you want the participants to take away during the presentation. And this will help avoid some of those digressions and also um, know some of the rabbit holes. So um, if you have, if this is your first training, I highly encourage you to sit in on other PSA grower trainings to hear some of the questions or even reach out to any one of the PSA team because they can probably give you a heads up that in certain modules, you're probably gonna get certain types of questions. And knowing those questions in advance or those sticky points that the participants might have some questions on will help you plan around um, and be able to address those questions appropriately. And again, instructors have homework too. So you need to be prepared with your resources and this will allow you to keep on time. And practice makes perfect. Um, I highly encourage you to spend time Presenting to an audience, I don't care if it's a stuffed animal audience or it's an audience um, of growers or your dog or other office mates, but just spend time doing the activity and presenting the information because you're always going to learn something about, 
oh, well, maybe I could have given them better instructions here to make the process move a little bit more smoothly. Or maybe, you know, they had questions that I really wasn't anticipating. And now when I come across that in my training, I'll be prepared to address that. So make sure that you're reaching out and doing some mock activities to get that feedback. And also just to know what your cadence is. When you're presenting um, to an audience, you may be a speaker who ends up going really fast, or you may be a speaker who maybe um, lingers a little bit too long, but the more you're familiar with the material and the more times you've practiced that material, the better off you're gonna be to manage your time. I also would say shoot for being under time all the time, because in the event that you run over, especially in a one day PSA training, it's going to significantly impact that agenda. So please be respectful of the other instructors time that they have on the agenda and make sure that you're shooting for under time um, so that you can address any technical issues that come up or questions with the activity. Um, and that will allow you to make sure that everyone's staying on track. Again, this is sort of an obvious one, but wear a watch or at least bring your smartphone up with you to um, your presentation so that you're keeping track of your own time and making sure that you're staying within the agenda. Or you can also enlist other individuals within your training team. Maybe you have a person that is gonna give you a, a red card that says five minutes um, prior to whenever your talk is gonna be done or at least having a timekeeper that walks around and make sure groups are moving from activity to activity on specific time points. But again, that goes back to having that planning, having the sheets of responsibilities for all of your team members to make sure that they know exactly what time things are happening and when people need to move from activity to activity. Another tip is to use automatic slide transitions. This one, I, I uh, would say proceed with caution because I have done this before. And if you get tripped up or if someone asks a question, then your slides keep rolling. So if you're the type of person that you just want to stay on task, you can set PowerPoint to advance the slides on a specific cadence, but just make sure that you practice that in advance so that um, you can stop it if you get hung up or if somebody has a question. And of course, you're always going to need to make course corrections throughout the training and especially in doing hands on activities. There's going to be situations where maybe the time runs over a little bit or maybe you're a little under just based on the interest of the group and the questions that are being asked. So I, I put on the slide to think about doubling down. And what I mean by that is when you're developing your presentation or you're working on a particular activity that you want to incorporate. Think of um, a short version and a full version or a longer version so that you can plan on which one you need to do based on how much time is left. So let's say for some reason or other earlier in the training, you started running behind, you ended up having to shave about 10 minutes off of the time that was allotted to make sure that everyone gets out on time. So now you're going to go to your, your first version of the um, activity or the presentation that you're giving that is a little bit shortened. So just keep that in the back of your mind as you're developing activities. You know, what is essential to the activity to make sure that it is effective? And what can we kind of extend if we do have that full, fully allotted amount of time? And always be professional. I personally find it really frustrating when you know, I have an agenda and I can see that we're going over time, I start getting stressed. You don't want people to be sitting in their seats wondering if they're going to get out on time because they've got a kid in daycare to pick up. It's better to say and assure them that you will get out on time to be respectful of their time and that the training team will make it up in other areas or even follow up um, after the training with that information or that activity. But always, always, always be respectful of the participants time because they're taking time away from their families, their farms, their businesses to attend this particular event that you're hosting. Hopefully, um, some of you might be familiar with this equation, but if not, this is something that I think over the last 10 years of working in food safety that I've really tried to think about incorporating into my trainings is sometimes, honestly, less is more. And the reason why I say that is because it's easy to just jam in tons of information, tons of activities, when in the end, having some very simple activities, simple messaging is really going to be the best for the learner to take away and actually go implement on their farm. So think about focusing on your audience needs, 
prioritizing what message it, that you want to um, be gleaned out of that particular activity. Make sure you're allowing extra time for questions, instructions. Again, hopefully that's been addressed in some of your pre-planning and, and hosting, you know, sort of mock presentations or mock activities that you can get that feedback. But inevitably, there'll be some um, questions at the training that you'll need to address. And of course, evaluations. I think that always gets squeezed into a really short period of time because we all want to have our little slice of the pie when we're doing our activities. And then make sure that you cover the content thoroughly. If you're going with a less is more approach, you can really make sure that you're covering it in a way that people understand and relate to. And this avoids rushing. You don't want to be that person who ends up um, pushing the module seven presenter. As we know, a lot of people do module seven at the end of the day, and they end up having this really condensed presentation with a lot of slides that they have to jam in. No one wants to do that to that person. So just be mindful of the time so that that last person in the day and other presenters that are going after you don't have to rush through their content. And put a bow on it. There's a lot of different ways to wrap up your training and make sure that you're managing time appropriately through um, some tools that I, I'm listing here. So one of these that I'm showing in the picture is the parking lot. In a lot of our in-person workshops, now you'll see, you know, that little post-it note, whiteboard in the background, whatever you can do to have a public space where if a question comes up, you can say, hey, I think we should table that conversation because we're going to talk about that in module seven, or, you know, we'll follow, I'll follow up with you individually on that, but keep it on the list. Or maybe it's something that you're going to follow up if it's a multi-day training, you know, come back in the morning to discuss that particular topic. And that really helps avoid some of those rabbit holes. It's also a great option to have sort of a post script option where, you know, you have some of the training team hanging around after the course concludes. That can be done um, online in a Zoom format or it can be done in person. But the people that have operation specific questions, you know, sometimes it is valuable during a training to talk about those specific scenarios because I think it, it does help some people work through um, the particular topic that we're teaching on. But at the same time, if it's too specific, they might not say, well, that person's asking you a question on apples. I don't grow apples. I'm only, you know, doing diversified vegetables or something. So it gives you an opportunity to follow up on operation specific questions after the training. So making yourself available for even pre office hours or post office hours. And it'll help you avoid um, going into those rabbit holes. And it gives you that opportunity to delve deeper into them in a time that is appropriate. So not diverting from the actual activity that you're doing, but trying to give some time to it either outside of the training um, where you can follow up with the person individually or, you know, maybe in the, the post session that goes on after the training concludes. And then obviously, you know, any type of email follow up you can do is another way that you can manage questions and just manage time throughout your training. So I think those are my suggestions um, for managing time in your trains. I hope that um, that was useful to some of you. Obviously, the expectation is not that you do every single one of these awesome activities that Kristen and Billy and the PSA team has outlined for you, but you be more selective in, in how you're tailoring your produce safety training. I have not been looking at the chat, so if there are questions, feel free to uh, bring them up. I don't think there were any questions. There was, uh, so let me scroll up. There was a couple of comments. Annalisa mentioned, um, I think highlighting your, your practice message that uh, their teams meet on Zoom about a month before the trainings and practice delivering the modules and the team uh, gives each other constructive feedback. And I had mentioned that I know even within the PSA team um, in doing practice modules, the topic of allowing time for the for questions to be asked, because I know as a trainer, I think sometimes learning how to answer those questions is one of the hardest things. Um, but yeah, that pretty much summarizes the chat box. But I did want to open it up and um, see if anybody had questions for any of our three speakers. We have a few few minutes to the end. And as, as people think of their questions, feel free to either raise your hand and I can let you speak, or you can put that in the chat box. Uh, but I was really curious, Gretchen, to your point, you had said at the end, um, you know, don't try to don't try to use all of these activities at once. So I was going to ask Kristen or Billy 
Do you find that in the out the activities that you outlined, are there any favorites or ones that you see kind of requested over and over? Uh, oh, well, I mean, the, the two that maybe sometimes are just, I mean, one that is just visually amazing is the cover crop soil health one. I mean, I have had a chance to do a couple of times now, if anyone's ever seen the NRCS rainfall simulator where the water goes back and forth, it's a very similar concept. And every time I am amazed by what covered healthy soil can do compared to bare ground soil. And that has a really big impact on the audience as well. I do, I do really enjoy that when you pull these activities together, you really focus, I think, on that overlap, not just food safety, but really overlap on some, some additional production practices and additional benefits. Okay, so we have a couple of questions coming in. Um, let's see, Emily asked, have you tried to adapt any of these? Ooh, good question. Have you tried to adapt any of these to a virtual format? I feel like maybe you can make the map one work, but it would be would be interested to hear what experiences you've had over Zoom. Yeah, well, actually, that's why we chose the map one for this webinar, um, because it's easily adaptable to an online format. Uh, we have tried to do videos of some things. Um, I don't feel like it does quite as well. Uh, so like sometimes we'll do Facebook Live and, and record some of the activities and we'll get, uh, you know, views uh, on Facebook. Um, but I am not convinced that we actually get like the skill building and the behavior change type impact that we're looking for with that. You know, it's more awareness raising and, you know, making materials accessible. Um, we did also develop, I think this was also part of the local food safety collaborative stuff, a, a series of online uh, YouTube videos around installing an irrigation system, a, a little small drip irrigation system. And those have been pretty good. There's an accompanying fact sheet for that. And then the YouTube videos are all like three minutes or less long on different components of installing that. Um, so I, I like that format in, in doing that. Um, because then folks can go back to it and watch it again if they're trying to install their irrigation system. So. Thanks, Kristen. So there were two other questions that, um, that were asked. And let's see, the first one is, um, we've discussed ways to keep attendees engaged, but I found myself with PSA training wanting to be sure that all the information is transferred over to the participants and sometimes that means making sure you're reading from the slide deck because there's there's so much information. Uh, does anyone have suggestions on how to make sure that the information gets covered without reading each slide? Um, I can take that one. Sure. Yeah. So I I think you know first and foremost you have to think about what is the key concept that is trying to be conveyed or key concepts. You know, obviously that regulatory symbol that's on the PSA slides is a good navigator to what information you really need to focus on covering to meet that regulatory requirement. But then also, you know, sort of distilling down or, or grouping some of those um, bullet points and providing an example instead. That's sort of how I've dealt with it is that you're not required to say every bullet point. And in fact, I'm pretty sure that participants would fall asleep if you did. Um, we don't have that expectation or PSA doesn't have that expectation that you know every single bullet point is gonna be covered, but think about an example where you could convey that information and also be mindful of those regulatory reference symbols because that's where I would, you know, kind of my eye goes to in my, my trainer manual, I have key points highlighted. I don't have every single thing highlighted, but I try to incorporate some sort of scenario or example to cover the material rather than just straight reading it. Thanks, Gretchen. Okay, so with that, uh, in, tr in trying to keep on time and respecting Gretchen's message, I am going to quickly share a couple of PSA updates. Um, and there are, I think, a couple, couple of, di of additional things coming in the chat box. But uh, you all should be able to see my screen. I want to quickly highlight our next educators call is going to be uh, in December 2022. We're still deciding on the exact date. Um, and we're going to be addressing FDA's traceability rule. Um, FDA is set to release the final, I believe, in early November. But 
part of this data is we're going to see actually what what comes out of that. But we are looking forward to the traceability rule. And the other quick update that I wanted to give was sharing with you the new PSA website. Um, you will see, or some of you may have noticed uh, two weeks ago, we migrated our website. So the actual website is the same. And we do have a number, I should say the address is the same. The website looks different. We tried very hard to stick, you know, it, it should be logical where everything is. Um, but we also do have redirects in place. So if you have bookmarks that were saved, if you click on them, it should go to the right direction. We tried very hard to do that. Um, but my request or PSA's request to all of you is if you have fact sheets that reference PSA fact sheets or um, any anything on the PSA website, we would request that you update those bookmarks because I do not think the redirects are going to be in place forever. So that's that's my update. Um, I'm going to pause. I see that there were some um, some back and forth going in the chat box. Is there anything else to mention from the chat box? Donna, somebody asked where they can find the grower training slides on the website. Perfect. Great question. So the PSA grower training slides are listed on the PSA website. So, um, however, because we ask that people attend a PSA train the trainer course before having access to the website, you need the actual link. So, um, oh, I see, Mary, I can follow up and send you an email. And if anybody else has the same request, uh, feel free to email me directly uh, or somebody from the PSA team and they will, they will be able to send you that exact link. I put my email in the chat box. Any other any other questions? Okay. Well, with that, I don't see any. Um, I do really want to thank our three speakers, uh, Kristen, Billy, and Gretchen. Thank you so much for the materials that you shared with us and the suggestions. I know I'm very excited to look through those fact sheets and uh, try to incorporate some of those activities in my next training. So thank you all very much, and uh, have a nice afternoon. Thanks for having us, Donna. Thank you, everybody. Bye.